Take it away. Okay. Good afternoon. This is Dialogue Conspiracy. This is, I think, the 121st week of the programs. They've been going on since 1970 when the Pentagon Papers were first exposed by Daniel Ellsberg. The subject today that we're going to talk about will be some more on the attempted assassination of Jim Dunbar, KGO, in San Francisco. We did a program on it last week, the case of Lawrence Kwong, who came up to the window and uh, held the gun to the glass and named it at the head of Jim Dunbar and then came around the office and shot Ben Munson and then killed himself. We're going to go into that subject matter and we're going into the testimony of Segretti, um, Donald Segretti, who was before the Senate hearings last week and he had two of his employees there. Uh, we're going to talk about those particular gentlemen and the testimony they gave. Um, uh, I think at the beginning of the program, at the end, I'll give some homework, some assignments. I like to think of this uh, time we share as a course where you look up your own material by your own articles, write letters to public officials, and keep up with what I'm saying by getting involved yourself. It isn't enough for me to just research this and read my eight papers a day and books and cross-file information for almost 10 years now to give it out in one hour and not let you follow up on some of this yourself. Um, some of the things I say are hard to accept or believe, but if you have tape cassettes, take it down and listen to it again at another time. If you lose it, you don't have it. And if you have it on tape, you can always erase it and play it over and compare what I say to the news or listen more carefully because sometimes you miss. I talk fast and there's certain things we miss as the program rolls along. Uh, there are letters uh, that I would like written. Uh, I'll tell you why at the beginning of the show and I'll try to allow time at the end. One is up to Sacramento, to the health and welfare uh, committees in Sacramento. You can write to Representative Bielenson, Senator Baer, B-E-H-R, Senator Marks, or Representative Alan Cerrote, or any of the men in Sacramento that you trust, the senators or assemblymen. But I mentioned these men, uh, Baer, Marks, uh, and Cerrote, Bielenson, it, and it's the state capital, Sacramento, 95814 and ask them to reverse the 1969 Landerman Petrus Short Act. We're going into that law and what is happening as a result of this law. We want that reversed and I'll explain why as the program goes on. The second letter I want people to write is to the Senate Select Committee investigating the campaign practices of 1972. There's a lot of Senate committees investigating various things in Washington. We specify the Watergate investigation. This coming week you're going to meet two agents that were employed for dirty tricks. One used the code name Sedan Chair and the other used the code name Fat Jack. But what you really want to know is you want to know that see Mr. Duke on the television on the wide screen. And I'm going into why we want Duke as a witness and why the Senate Watergate Committee is covering this up. <clears throat> just selecting those other two gentlemen with no intention of calling Duke. Last week when the hearings were going on, uh, Senator Montoya had the following dialogue with Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz was hired by Donald Segretti. He's a member of the Young Republicans in Florida, Tampa, Florida. Montoya said, did you have two subordinates? One was named Duke and the other Herring. Is that right? And Ben said his name was Duke. I don't know his last name. Montoya asked, did Mr. Herring tell you this man, Duke, was a former SS officer for Adolf Hitler's stormtroopers? Correct. Did Duke tell you that? I don't recall if he did or not. Did you believe that being trained by Adolf Hitler and his stormtroopers could particularly qualify for the duties you assigned him? Benz replied, I don't know of any training school that would train him for this work. Montoya said, weren't the activities quite similar? Didn't Hitler's stormtroopers perform similar activities to which you engaged in Florida? I wouldn't know that, Senator, he replied. You read some history of that period, didn't you? Correct. The rise and fall of the Third Reich? Correct. Weren't the activities of the stormtroopers somewhat similar? I don't see the similarity, Senator. I thought they were, Senator Montoya said. I read about falsified documents during that era libel, slander, ruined reputations. One of the ways, as I recall, that Adolf Hitler seized power. Do 
Do you think Duke carried on his activities in an exemplary fashion in that manner, do you? Yes, sir, said Mr. Benz. That was his reply. Now, uh, at the time that Richard Nixon and Mr. William Sullivan of the FBI and the CIA and the Armed Forces and were using Tom Charles Houston to make up a plan for a secret police force inside the White House in 1970, William Shire had an interview. It was March 13, 1970. And he asked the question, will the U.S. future have a legal dictatorship? And he referred to the genius of propaganda, an organization that Adolf Hitler had. And Shire said Hitler never got more than 39% of the vote in a free election. But I think the American people now would vote for almost anything that would put down the so-called peaceniks and the college kids and the blacks. He made comparisons at that time between Spiro Agnew, Richard Nixon, and John Mitchell, their law and order uh, uh, program and their attitude towards dissenters. William Shire said the know-nothingness to which Nixon, Agnew, and appeal is frightening. They are appealing to the lowest denominator of the people. I can't remember a time in American history when the top men in government appealed to what they knew were the worst instincts of people. This was written in 1970. And as a result, they who campaigned are bringing together uh, bring us to get who should bring us together have torn us asunder. They appeal to the ignorant against the educated. They're appealing to the South and Midwest against the intellectuals and the East. They're giving the impression that New York, Washington, and Berkeley are places full of communists. These people talk about violence and they're hypocritical. Nobody likes violence per se, but William Shire said they're turning children against their parents, the college generation against the community. They don't understand what the kids are doing, and the stormtroopers of Germany were organized by a national group of adults that had nothing to do with students or universities. These people were trained to break up democratic movements and political parties, and most of the time, they didn't even know what they were doing. The youth in the universities were sort of organized by Hitler and the Nazi party. Well, the Young Americans for Freedom was a group that was going to be violent in Miami. They had reservations in Miami. Sturgis, who was arrested at the Watergate Hotel, had reservations for Young Americans for Freedom. This Mr. Benz was from that organization. Um, I'm going into the rundown of, of Se Donald Segretti briefly to show you what they didn't ask him when he was called on the stand. Theodore White, in the new book, Making of a President, said, Donald Segretti's attempt at sabotage in the United States had the weight of a feather. Now, that is a cover-up. That is a lie. That is a book written to hide the fascism and the Nazism that's taking place in this country. James Ray has a lawsuit pending against uh, an author who wrote a, the story of his life and the alleged assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. He says it's not a true story. He resents the story, and there's a lawsuit pending now. The, what are the historical documents of our time? That book was written by Gerald Frank, who also wrote The Boston Strangler, and that was a lie, too. The man has never had a trial, and that was another fabrication of a series of mass murders. Gerald Frank wrote a book on the shooting of Martin Luther King. That is, The lawsuit is pending now. James Ray said it's a fabrication. The story that Theodore White said Segretti's attempt at sabotage had the weight of a feather, only wears truth because the men were all rounded up before the uh, conventions in Miami. Donald Segretti said that when the men were arrested at the Watergate, they were all told to go under, lose their chain of command, go to Jamaica, take a train to California, and get lost, period. That was in June, and no one's traces were to be found at the time of the convention. The team that would bring in the violence would not be around. Donald Segretti was a classmate of Dwight Chapin, the appointment secretary in the White House. Chapin and Segretti were meeting in San Diego with the extreme, violent Minutemen, the people who accused Richard Nixon of treason. They were capable of killing him. They were ready to kill him. They would bring in our martial law. They were going to kill public officials. The New Ramparts article, September 1973, that's out now, has an article written by Andrew Popkine, and Lewis Tackwood helped him write it. Lewis Tackwood has the tapes documentation to show the assassination plans of Richard Nixon. It was in the newspaper again today that Richard Nixon's afraid of assassination, and he gets a lot of hate letters. The hate letters will be the Minutemen working for the Central Intelligence Agency, and Richard Nixon is more scared than ever as of October the 8th, 1973. But Tackwood has tapes that the Senate Select Committee will not listen to or hear on the plans to assassinate Richard Nixon and take over the government. 
The committee did not ask Segretti about his San Diego meetings uh, any more than they asked Mr. Magruder when he was on the stand, Jim Magruder, about his meetings with John Mitchell and the American Nazi Party out in California at the Hilton Hotel. Segretti said under oath he hired eight people and uh, Congressman Gurney, Senator Gurney, was really smug. He says, oh, you know, I forget the exact words. Come now, what could this little bit do in the total bill of the election? He said under oath he hired eight. But right there at the stand, another investigator, a member said, isn't it true there were more? There were 10 or 12, and later the record was, uh, was changed to 28. Donald Segretti hired 28. But he hired a classmate in Tennessee, for example, a lawyer. All of these were registered Democrats, incidentally, including Segretti, to sabotage the Democratic Party, working for the White House and paid by Richard Nixon's personal ator attorney, Herbert Kalmbach. Segretti said to his three attorney friends down in Tennessee, each of you hire five men, but don't tell them who the, the money comes from or what it's for, and many of them were offered high jobs in the White House after the election were over. If he would tell an attorney in Tennessee to get five men and don't tell him about it, five by twenty-eight would make a hundred and forty. But if he told each one of those twenty, if each one of those was going to get an agent, five agents, that would be a hundred and forty, and hardly eight, hardly eight. Then he told them uh, they were registered in six states. He concentrated on six states. Well, there were assassination plans for Richard Nixon in New York, Miami. There's assassination teams all over the country or violence teams. If you have San Diego, Miami, and other cities where Richard Nixon would visit, like Rhode Island and New Hampshire, where there was a struggle with Mr. Haldeman and the Secret Service about protecting Richard Nixon when the lines were to be broken. If you have a team of agents, registered Democrats, violence uh, with arsenals of weapons, which these men had procured and were ready to use, and this can be documented, if you have them in key cities, You'd blame the Democrats later, and they could cover up the evidence of who were the conspirators. You're talking about the appointment secretary of the president, funding and contacting and receiving calls from Segretti on the road. Now, the plans for Miami were called off. There was no violence there, but Howard Hunt was meeting with Segretti in Miami. Under testimony, Hunt said that his safe was broken over, and they took future plans from his desk and destroyed them, and the Senate Select Committee never asked what what were the other plans? What else were they going to do? Because they don't know. But among those plans was a road map with the arteries cut off and the intersections cut off that looked just exactly like uh, the military takeover of Chile or of Greece, which Mr. Hunt knows about working with the CIA since its inception in 1945 with the OSS before that. They never discussed when he was called what the road maps were, were and the arteries that were cut off and the radio communications. But Segretti was meeting Hunt down in Miami. Uh, one of the men that they hired, uh, they asked Donald Segretti uh, how he got these men. He called a man named Mr. Kelly. He called the Republican office and said, uh, do you have someone who'd like to work for me? That's a lie under, oh, it's true, he called that way. But Mr. Kelly was very neatly arranged. When Kelly got on the stand, they said, who did you work for? And he said, well, I work for Claude Kirk of Florida, ran his campaign. Kirk was the governor before the present governor came in. He ran at the same time that Ronald Reagan ran in California, and the two were determined. He ran a campaign in Florida that he was going to break the University of California. And the next day, the, they had lunch after his victory and Reagan's victory. They met in California. And the next day, the president of the University of California was fired on one day's notice with no pay, and that was the begin of the scare tactics of the University of California. Claude Kirk is head of the Wackenhut Corporation. He uses it as a private police force, a, a paramilitary, military, FBI, Secret Service agents, intelligence agents, and it's centered, uh, it's a nest of agents in Miami that works with Bahamas and Argentine, South America, Nazi police force. Um, Mr. Claude Kirk is uh, sent Martin Kelly. That's one of the men. You see, they look very innocent, like they just sent some letters. They forged a document that said Mr. Jack and Senator Jackson was a homosexual. The problem wasn't the letters they sent about Humphrey or Senator Jackson or Muskie. That is the least of it. The question is the arsenal of weapons that Liddy was buying in Virginia, the weapons that were in their car when they were arrested, the hotel reservations for young Republicans. Those young Republicans were SS stormtroopers, 
hardly young Republicans, and uh, they went under this cover, but these are adult men that were trained in sabotage and have been doing it ever since they worked for Adolf Hitler. Now, they hired uh, this Martin Kelly was one of the people, and Mr. Benz uh, was the second agent who hired Duke. Uh, at the meetings that Segretti was at down in, in Miami, Mr. Martinez was there, and Barker, he says he doesn't remember them. Uh, uh, the names, they happen to be at the meeting, but he doesn't remember them. Uh, Mr. Frank Sturgis was making reservations for these young Republicans and violence in Miami. Nobody asked Donald Segretti on the stand if he knew Frank Sturgis or if the reservations uh, that Duke had, if the little committee that they were bringing in was the same kind of Nazis that I wrote about in the Realist article three weeks after they were arrested called Why Was Martha Mitchell Kidnapped? and wanted to know if those Nazi Army intelligence Americans trained in Germany intelligence that had been brought to Dallas for the John Kennedy assassination were being used in Miami. Those questions were never asked. Uh, the Minutemen work with the CIA. They work with the American Nazi Party. They work with the White House. The funding comes from our tax dollars. Uh, the pamphlets they sent out were racist down there. They were off-color. They were making fun of blacks and uh, their Jews or anti-Semitic uh, letters and insinuations in what they were doing. And, and if you wonder about it, uh, look at the origin of where these people came from. Donald Segretti went to Miami where he got the name of a printer. The CIA provided him with a printer. Once again, the CIA provided all of the equipment they needed. All the letters that are forged, they could say, well, we didn't know it was for forged documents, but they recommend a printer that they knew was a CIA printer, just like the photographer that, that did the work at the lab when they developed things taken from the Democratic headquarters was a CIA photographer. The Senate Select Committee is hiding international Nazis, and they're hiding the Nazis in the Bahamas, in Miami, the assassination plans of Richard Nixon, the plans for killing in Miami of congressmen, the Liddy plan for rounding up the radicals. They're going into this really soft marshmallow thing. Let's talk to Sedan Chair too, and let's let's handle something that's really easy. We don't want to get let's carry Fat Jack and Sedan Chair too. So I hope that uh, during the week you will write letters to the Senate Select Committee, one of them, all of them, whatever you want, and tell them that you want Duke on that white screen and you want to know why. When Donald Segretti is on, they don't ask questions about his meeting in San Diego with the extreme right-wing Minutemen and with Dwight Chafe and the appointment secretary of the president. And what about the reservations for young Republicans? Uh, did this tie into Sturgis? Did, did Duke work with Sturgis down in Miami? Those are the questions they're not asking, and they're wasting precious time, and they bring us to the brink of a very heavy kind of fascism that William Shire was talking about in 1970 when the government already was forming its little team. Now, last week uh, we talked about a subject which was of interest. It was challenging because I jumped around on a lot of different points, and I think it was one of the most important broadcasts I've done on Dialogue Conspiracy. I'm going to give just a five-minute resume of last week's show for those who missed it, and then I'm going to talk about the six newspaper articles that came out since we met on October the 1st and show you some more information that I've gotten. Uh, I'm beginning to get, I, I do so much work on assassinations and conspiracies and the plans to take over the government, and I think sometimes I take my research for granted, but when a man who's a member of the CIA or former member of the CIA met this last week with Paul Krasner and gave him some information for Paul and me to expose some of the things because he said what I said was true and the things I'm telling you are true and he wanted you to know about it and we're going to share some of that. When he backed up what I was saying with what he knows by working in the agency, I think it was really the first time in three years that I've been doing Dialogue Conspiracy or in ten years that I've been doing my research that I got scared because I felt that what I say to you can be backed up and documented and it's accurate. But to have a backup of a man who has been in the agency and says, yes, what you're saying is true and there's more besides, is really very scary. Well, last week we talked about, as I say, about Lawrence Kwong. He walked up to the glass at KGO. It's right on Golden Gate Street. He held a gun. He, the glass was bulletproof. Jim Dunbar spoke up, get the police. Mr. Kwong went around the corner in the building, killed Ben Munson, went down the street and killed himself. 
Uh, we mentioned last week the important thing. With, there's about six important things that I wanted to bring out. One was the weapon. The weapon was a puzzlement to the police. It shouldn't be in a simple, homo- simple homicide. It was a puzzlement to the police. A private detective by the name of John Immendorf was, had vi- been visited by Lawrence Kwong, and Lawrence Kwong had told him that he had an implant placed inside his head, that he was being programmed, and he wanted help. He said a radio receiver was implanted in his stomach and received broadcasts from Dunbar and Easton, and then he was in agony, and he wanted Immendorf to help him and sabotage the KGO transmitter, that it was disturbing him to be uh, programmed into KGO. He had been on a trip. Uh, Mr. Kwong said he was kidnapped. The fact is that he had been to Honolulu in August of 1972, his excuse being to get away from the broadcast in KGO. Uh, at the time, I questioned last week how, what job he had, who paid for the trip, what time did he go to Honolulu, what date did he arrive, what day did he leave, who paid for the trip, who did he visit in Honolulu to see if he was in a medical hospital run by the Army for programming. I mentioned his mother lives in Hong Kong, his father, who lives somewhere in the United States. He was naturalized after one year coming into this country from Hong Kong, which is an unusually early time. He has a brother, allegedly, on the peninsula. No mention of him. He used to have an apartment on California Street. It doesn't say who visited the apartment, who paid the rent, what job he held when he had the apartment on California Street. His medical records are a secret. This is the law that was made in '69. That may be one of the most dangerous laws we have in California and should be revoked as soon as possible, the 1969 Lanterman Petrus Short Act. Because of that act, everything locked up at St. Mary's Pacific Medical Center cannot be seen. The motive for this particular uh, shooting, if he was programmed, would be to intimidate radio stations, to test transmitter systems, and terrorize the community against mental patients. Uh, this man had a death list of personality at KGOs, a diary, and a writing on the wall, just like the other conspiracies planned by the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, was he programmed? Did he have implants? Was he hypnotized? I brought out the uh, references of Dr. Delgado at Yale, who has built these Stymo Sievers for the last 20 years. He's paid by the U.S. Public Health Service and the Office of Naval Research. Dr. Delgado spoke at the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers at the Hilton Hotel in New York about developing battery-less radio receivers inside brains, and he puts them inside brains where they're capable when planted of completely under the skin of stimulating brain areas. I referred to a book, Were We Controlled, by Lincoln Lawrence, a man who worked in the Defense Department in the media. He was in the media. It was an alias. I got the name from back east this week. He was 25 years for the Defense Department in radio and broadcasting. At the time of the John Kennedy assassination, Lincoln Lawrence heard of a plot while he was in the Defense Department, the plan to kill Oswald and Ruby and Kennedy. It was a 67-page book, and he spent three years looking for it in Chicago, and I referred to the assassination plan to kill uh, John Kennedy in Chicago, at the Army game, it was November the 1st. He was supposed to be killed there, but uh, the Secret Service got wind of it, so they got him finally in Dallas three weeks later. The novel was written by David Warren. Warren is the pen name, Edward L. Warren, that Howard Hunt uses. Edward J. Warren is the name McCord uses. Mr. Warren is the name that Segretti used when he met in Miami, and Mr. Warren, who was E. Howard Hunt. The novel, and E. Howard Hunt has written 35 or more novel, novels while in the CIA, This novel on the killing of Kennedy, the programming of Oswald and Ruby, was written by Warren. We covered that in detail on last week's show. So for those of you who didn't hear it, I wanted to run down what I'm driving at in terms of the news this week. Did they find out any more about the weapon? Did they find out any more about Kwong up in San Francisco, about his family, uh, about his mental condition? The first article to come out, our radio broadcast was on the 1st. October the 2nd, the next day, there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle. Case study, a mental autopsy for KGO killer. Dr. Decker from San Francisco Mental Health Department was going to do what he called a psychological autopsy. Now, this is what you get on all the alleged assassins. Nothing about where they lived, who paid their rent, how they got their vacations, how they were employed, who they were meeting. They diverted from the actual homicide and criminology to this kind of a... B.S. Uh, dialogue about his mental state at the time that the person 
held the gun. Dr. Decker said this is a tragedy that offers mental health authorities a unique opportunity to study the anatomy of such an eruption. I say the hell with all that. The mental health authorities are locking up all the story of the man's treatment, where he went and what his condition was. So they're using this murder, death, suicide as an excuse to study a unique opportunity, not a homicide opportunity to solve a crime, but just a unique opportunity. Dr. Decker said, we'll learn how to improve clinical care of the mentally ill, how to protect the public. Mr. Arnani from uh, Nazi Germany, who was in a concentration camp, said that when fascism comes to this country, it'll be sold by public or relations offices. Dr. Decker, mental health is going to protect the public. We'll study mental hospitals and get new legislation. Every time there's an assassination or a federal conspiracy, we get new legislation. He refused to discuss uh, Kwong's diagnosis. He said Kwong was well known to a number of treatment centers. He'd been in a number of them in California, and he had long and intensive care on a voluntary basis. Now, voluntary is an interesting word because the man went to a detective for help and said he'd been kidnapped. Dr. Decker said that six months ago he had three days of involuntary hospital care, and then for three months he was in the intensive care unit of St. Mary's Hospital. They won't tell you what that was about. Intensive care in a hospital could be surgery. It was involuntary. He was put against his wishes. That was six months ago. Did it coincide after the Honolulu trip? What time period was in the hospital, and what was the medication for the intensive care? That usually is your surgical treatment. He said many psychiatric workups were done on Kwong, but they would not reveal that they were because he wasn't considered dangerous or ill. He's in the intensive care unit for three months, but he's not considered dangerous or ill. Then they went on to say that Dr. Mr. Kwong, in quotes, was getting the best treatment that the art of psychiatry has to give. Well, that has to be true because they were probably trying out the very newest, and the newest to them is the best. The second article in the newspaper this week Look and see how many we were on mental health this week. The next article is October the 3rd, two days later. Major U.S. shift on mental health. Casper Weinberger, who I wrote up in my new article in The Realist. Incidentally, the Thunderbird, the local Thunderbird, is out of The Realist, so don't go there and get them. We'll get a stack during the week, but uh, after next week, come and read it. I refer to Mr. Weinberger cutting the domestic uh, needs of our country. He talked about combining alcohol, drug abuse, and mental health. The federal government just dropped $38 million of federal funds and to, uh, out of 515 community mental hospitals across the United States. They're going into a period of mind control. They're not going to need the mental hospitals. They've dropped $38 million from mental hospitals, and 10% of the mental health budget of San Francisco is out. $6 million that would have gone into uh, hospitals in San Francisco area is out, and only certain federal places where they keep their records secret, like for Mr. Uh, Huang, I'm sure will be available for funding, and the rest will be closed out. The third article in the paper after our radio show last week, October the 3rd, was by Maxine Cheshire. The news isn't on the front pages, it's in the society column. It's called The Strange Case of Mrs. Hunt. It's about her uh, death in Chicago on the airplane. I mentioned that. The two neurosurgeons whose name she had at the time she died, one was a Dr. Gary Morris, and the other uh, doctor, Dr. Marvin Korngold, the neurologist. Well, the article, The Strange Case of Mrs. Hunt, was that Dr. Morris and his wife are dead. They died under mysterious circumstances in the Caribbean, and no trace of them has been found. Dr. Marvin Korngirl is a neurologist, but the record said that Dr. Um, Morris was a hypnosis, that hypnosis was one of the tools of his therapy that he was known for. We talked last week about hypnotizing a person and getting them under. Before you plant these electrodes, they have no control. You can hypnotize them, and then you can plant uh, directions, radio control inside their head and give them orders on the ways to move. The next article pertaining to this uh, event at San Francisco was October the 6th. Five days later, there was an inquest at, of the AGO shooting, and let me tell you about that in San Francisco because it's in keeping with my suspicions on the whole thing. In the first place, the Can San Francisco Chronicle called it a routine affair with a partic particular out predictable outcome. You get that with any of the shootings. Uh, the CIA conspiracies of domestic murders, their routine inquests, the investigations are decided before they get into the matter. The coroner, uh, Mr. Jindrick, was very frustrated. He, he said in the article that he could not obtain any information 
about the mental illness of the psychiatric treatment the coroner couldn't. Dr. David Tomasini, the assistant medical director at St. Mary's Hospital, testified at the inquest. He only went on advice of his counsel. He was represented by a lawyer. I mean, here's a man who's, who's from Hong Kong who pulls a gun and shoots, and the doctor has come on the advice of his lawyer. He said Kwong was an impatient at the institution. He wouldn't say what dates he was hospitalized, or he would not discuss his mental illness. Dr. Robert Underwood, a psychologist from the West Side Lodge, where uh, Mr. Kwong was a resident at the daytime, he said he would not give any dates of when he went in there, no diagnosis while he was there, that Lodge residents are not permitted to have handguns. He wouldn't talk about the handgun. The doctor wouldn't give a date, a diagnosis. The two doctors wouldn't give any advice. Their attorneys were with him. Eric Goodhill, a psychologist at the hospitality house, refused to discuss Kwong's problems. There were three men there. They wouldn't give any dates of when they knew him or anything about him. The coroner was more concerned uh, about Kwong's possession of a gun. The police inspector, Her Hobart Henson, said very little known about the .22 automatic. It was manufactured in 54. It was sold to Roos Brothers. There's no record of it anywhere. They don't know how the weapon fell into Kwong's hands, and it's a mystery. In every conspiracy, the weapon, the weapon ownership, where it came from, who supplied it, is the mystery. The evidence is locked up. It's no different than locking up all the testimony on the John Kennedy assassination as much as they could in the archives for 75 years as these three doctors. They won't even give date that he entered the hospital. What is so secret about that? The weapon is still a mystery. The, then the police department wants more con gun controls. So this is another purpose for programming these people and a lot of killings that are going to be taking place, uh, I believe, or for the purpose of confiscating private weapons in this country. The next news article on October the 3rd, there was a whole rash of them that followed this particular shooting, very synchronized and for a purpose, was more important. It was from Dr. Ross Addy from UCLA. He is the man who talks about the electrical fields. His article this week was electrical fields may affect brain behavior, the doctors say. And Dr. Ross Addy, I've talked about on my program, to stop the UCLA school to, for violence that uh, Ronald Reagan wants, and we'll go into that, that was going to end violence by in five years. Dr. Ross Addy works on astronauts and on brain problems, brain uh, transplants, electric uh, electrodes inside the brain. He talked about 1960 in Germany, human volunteers were being used, and now they have a 24-hour biological clock, which can be thrown off by these tests, by electrical fields generated by machinery and power that affects the brain and the way you move around and uh, uh, think. It, it can change your behavior. He said this research raises the question of whether you have the potential means of modifying behavior. And Dr. Addy said, well, it may have electric blankets in the future that will emit fields and frequencies that will induce sleep. And artificial frequencies added together heighten your brain activity. And in others, they cancel out and depress your brain cells. Now, I'm going to, this is Ross Addy this week talking about electrical brains affecting your tower. And uh, I don't want to jump around too much, but this man who was with the CIA that met with Paul Krasner mentioned in San Francisco that there's a Citro Tower and a Trans-American Tower. There's two towers. One is owned by ABC, that's KGO, built to get stronger signals. And Mr. Kwong said he was controlled by KGO. And the purpose, this is what this man said in San Francisco. He said the purpose is going to be to extend a beam so that you have virtual radio control of the entire city. And a special hospital will be built in a federal prison where electric implantations are going to be inserted. Now, you have two men, one in San Francisco who had worked inside the CIA, and one is Dr. Ross Ad at UCLA warning us that we ha will have electrical fields that affect your behavior, both having worked in, with the government, working with the government agencies. One is telling what you're going to get in the future, and one is telling me they've set up the towers. The gentleman up in San Francisco said these towers, a special hospital, I said, will be built and a federal prison, and they will put electric implantations inserted into the heads of the prisoners, and they will be supplied with men and equipment, federally controlled thought process. The trans electrodes will have receivers and transmitters. The persons will be instructed with a transmitter planted within the brain from the wired electrode to a central computer and be monitored. Whenever feelings go beyond a certain point, the computer clicks over and sends a source of energy to a transmitter in the brain. This is the script that this man sent to me on a tape cassette that I typed out. 
This triggers the relay to release stored energy within the capacitator subdue human beings. He said it is better than having people locked up in prisons and screaming. But not only that, there's a radio frequency beam that destroys and makes impossible for people to meditate. Now, I have a file. I have a file going back for 10 years on thousands of subjects, you know, that I've been watching this thing come down. And one was planting these little electric boxes inside of prisoners as they get released and in a closed area of Watts in Los Angeles. They were to test this out. And if a prisoner goes within a certain geographic area of five miles, the thing beeps and he has to go back to his own area. He can't leave to go anywhere else. And before he lives, leaves prison, these will be inserted in him. I didn't look that up before I came to the show today, but uh, Ross Addy in Los Angeles this week was talking about these electrical fields that will be able to heighten your activity or cancel your activity. And the gentleman in San Francisco is talking about the two towers that are built, the new Trans-American Tower and the Citro Tower. And just by coincidence, I was informed that Citro is ABC, which is KGO. So what did this poor man know that he goes to a private detective and says that he's being programmed by KGO? Is he on that line that they are testing that this man wanted to tell me about? Uh, Dr. Ross Addy came out with that this week. To top that off, there was another article about a brain operation. This was October the 8th this morning in the paper. Brain operation cured two men of violence. Well, whoopee, two got cured. I mean, what about all of Vietnam? Look at the violence of robbing planes and napalm and bombs and, and the Pentagon and Chile, uh, these assassination squads. We have torture in 30 countries now that American equipment is making. And the paper today has an article about the AID, the school in Texas, to teach bombing and uh, all over the world to police forces of military dictatorships. Jack Anderson has it today. We're wor worrying about a surgeon at the University of California curing two men of violence. When this country is the most violent uh, country that ever exists, I think it's out doing anything that Hitler ever dreamed of or got away with by importing his particular agents and scientists and incorporating them with our natural racism and lust for violence. Uh, this great man, Dr. John Adams, has a news account. It, it's just so fantastic. He thinks that he's, he's got two violent men who he's implanted tiny electrodes in their brains. This is October the 8th, 1973 and he reduced their violence. Why don't they pull this in Washington? What Dr. Adams was saying that he certainly wouldn't, this is very controversial, and he wouldn't think of gross things like frontal lobotomies or psychosurgery to change the behavior of prison inmates. But what do you think they're going to use with his inventions, at these little electrodes that they're using after he moves out? The, the technique is there because he wouldn't use it. doesn't mean that there aren't a 100 waiting for him to use it. 25% of the SS squad, the Gestapo, the doctors and psychiatrists that did the most heinous experiments of glass and torture and, and medical experiments in Nazi Germany were college professors and medical profession. Don't put it past uh, anybody to use this little technique. He's used it on two men that were in automobile accidents and left them nonviolent. But that isn't why they're doing this experimentation. He has a legitimate use a public relations office, and it comes out the same week as all this other news in one week on brain affairs. Dr. Adams said many people don't approve of during, doing surgery to change behavior, but in some cases, it's the only way to help the patient. Well, unfortunately, um, the team that's in office in Washington and Sacramento decides who the patients are. Jessica Midford was on television, on radio yesterday on KGO. She wrote a book kind and unusual punishment on the prison business. It's an excellent book. And somebody called in and asked what she thought about brain control and, and mind control over the prisoners. And her answer was that she has in her possession a memo of Raymond Procunier, the head of the Department of Corrections up at San Quentin in California, in Sacramento, where he asked the federal government for $48,000 of the state government in order to do brain operations to alter the brains of his violent prisoners. Well, I happen to correspond daily with Procunier's most violent prisoner, Hugo Pinnell. I call up Jessica Medford to talk about this because Hugo's a poet. He's a man who's been framed. He's been provoked. He's considered a radical. Mr. Procunier says, um, if I have a bunch of radicals, I'm not going to let them out. There's a new book out that was mentioned yesterday in the San Francisco Chronicle about 
pr the proving ground or the training ground of radicals in prisons. And the Im implication was if you let them out, there'll be terror around. Well, Dr. Adams says that in some cases, it's the only way to help the patient. But who is the patient and who is the prisoner and how did they get there? And why are the almas been in those prisons to get their cases and no lawyers to get them out and prove their innocence? And who is rearranging the value system of who is violent and nonviolent? And who is the prisoner, who is the guilty, and who is the innocent? I'm getting so tired of these public relation jobs that they're protecting the public. Ronald Reagan offered, if we had this school for nonviolence, he offered in January, that violence would be cured in 1975. There is no doubt the violence will not be cured by 75. If you don't get these things repeal, turn back and again write to Sacramento and ask them to uh, open up the 1969 Lanterman Act, just on this Lanterman Petrus Short Act, just on this one thing, and get the record state. It's funny that Ronald Reagan promised to end violence by 1975 because Chief of Police Davis in Los Angeles, who is now hiring J. Walter Thompson, advertising agent that handled Richard Nixon's career, Chief of Police Davis had an article October the 2nd this week, too, where he said crime will be cut 50% across the nation in five years. Well, with their plan, they will end crime if that is the kind of way you want to end crime. And some of the things that they, the way they want to end crime are listed in the tape that this man made from the CIA. And they go down the line with files that I have. And this is their definition of ending crime. And it's easy to do it their way. Every child is registered at birth. It's going to have secret, the uh, security card numbers and you have to register at the hospital or at home. He has to have a registration card. Every aggressive or provocative child is going to be treated and they can receive drugs at school sedatives and they will be diagnosed if they kick the teacher or ask questions or appear aggressive. They will be diagnosed when they're very young. An article came out this week about the military men getting out of the service. They have 530 points that they're graded on right down the line and one congressman objected so they were going to reduce it to 130 points. Every way they looked right or left, a man in New England applied for a job and couldn't get the job and they found out that he received an underground newspaper when he was in the military. Maybe that's grade 529 or, or 127 is against him. He, everyone getting out of the military because the military will be used as a new police force and Gestapo and every man has been watched and graded. Gas rationing is going to take place in the fall, so you can't go very far if, you, if you're going to the right places. Or, uh, you'll get gas within a certain limit. You have only your car to go to a certain point. You can't leave. Passports will be given. This, this gentleman mentioned the passports to geographic areas. Maybe you'll go to five states, and that's all. The airports now have a place to record you, list you. They have computers to look everybody up who travels, x-ray everything you've got, and all airports will be closed except two. I want to do a show I started a few weeks ago on the new Texas airport. That he mentioned, this man from the CIA, and there's one other. That ex-Texas airport that Richard Nixon's going to open, 66 ramps. It's larger than Manhattan Island. This will be one of the places that you'll move into. There will only be two places that you can arrive in. Every house apartment will be listed. This gentleman from the CIA had mentioned that every house for the last five years, everywhere you dwell or live will be listed and registered and this very week that I got this information I read that LEAA law enforcement in order to protect you from robbers wants to list your home. The post office will have your address moving and a special number for you to check your mobility. The borders to Canada and Mexico will be closed off. Guns will be called in like Nazi Germany. They come into your homes. There will be no private guns. There will be two-way radio into your home, a TV, videotapes in every courtroom. They're putting them in San Francisco now. He mentioned 32 cameras in San Francisco on the streets, videotapes of every major street, radio beams to control mass behavior, implants into prisoners or other ones. They take you in prison. It doesn't matter if you've done a crime. Well, this is a list of horrors that Chief of Police Davis came out. This week he was going to end crime 50% by 75. Ronald Reagan was going to cure violence by 1975. And um, I'm very suspicious of the way the the news this week made me more suspicious than ever. Last week when we did our show, the shooting had just taken place. It was a few days, and I realized that there was a lot of things that were fishy about that uh, shootout up in San Francisco. But this last week, there's been a flood of newspaper articles along the subject on the electric behavior, the brain behavior, and uh, 
the plans is Dr. Addy at UCLA synchronized with up north, the, the quiet of the doctors, not even telling the date the man was a patient. The excuse for all of the laws and legislation we have is to protect society. And yet, when a man has killed another person and could be a danger to many people before he killed himself, we can't go into what happened to him. He asked for help. He didn't get help. The autopsy on his body, I'm sure, was superficial. Maybe they didn't even get into the head to see if anything was implanted or if he was programmed. Or are the doctors at the medical center that he goes to, federal doctors, are they paid by the federal government, the military? Uh, what kind of intensive care did he have? Where is his family? How did he get his passport? How did he get his weapon? What is the KGO tower about? Uh, I hope nurses in the Bay Area and doctors will keep their eyes open or electricians and write to Sacramento and ask questions. Write to Jim Dunbar or Jim Eason or... Uh, Roy L. Well, if you heard the show today, and ask them to pursue the investigation. Write to Sacramento and get that law opened up and open up those files because to hide what's going on up there means it just moves into your own community where they want to put a camera in Monterey and photograph everything right in our local community. The suggestion was made, and I don't think people objected to that. And the camera and the controls are moving here, too. Well, our time is up. I don't mean to scare you too much, but you may as well share some of my agony. It was a heavy week. So keep well, and I'll see you next week.